Ciao! Today we're going to talk about recording levels and how to properly set up the best gain structure prior to your recording project. Now every time you record something, you're probably going to ask yourself, how loud should I record? What is the best gain structure that will prevent my converters to clip and introduce distortion? Or how is the bare minimum low volumes I can record my source at? So this is exactly what we're going to be talking today, demystifying a little bit more the question of how loud or soft should I record something and how to properly set it up the right gain structure for your project. Now, recording involves different steps. Now, the first step is, of course, choosing an instrument to record. Now, every time we record something, the instrument will emit a sound. Now, this sound is going to move through the elastic medium, in this case, air, causing a turbulence. So, pushing and pulling very small atoms and molecules that are going to move in an ever-expanding sphere wave fashion, creating a set of rarefaction and compression, also described as sine wave. Once the sound is going to hit our microphone, the microphone job is to transduce a form of energy into another. In other words, a microphone could also be described as transducer. As I said before, a transducer is a device that will transduce a form of energy into another. Now, let's take, for this example, a dynamic microphone. The dynamic microphone is constituted of a diaphragm attached to a coil of wire immersed into a magnetic field. As soon as the sound will hit the diaphragm, the diaphragm will start vibrating upon the four physical properties, being frequency, period, wavelength, and amplitude. Now, this vibration, given the fact that the diaphragm is attached to a coil of wire immersed into a magnetic field, will create a voltage. So our first form of energy will be transformed into voltage. The voltage will travel through our XLR cable and reach our preamplifier, which is the first part of setting a proper gain structure for the material that will feed our Pro Tools. Now, through our preamplifier, we're going to be preamplifying, in other words, setting up a proper level of our signal prior to hit our converters. Our converters, HDIO converters, will convert the sound from a voltage to binary digit, so zeros and one, based, of course, on the sample rate and the bit depth we have chosen for our project. So now the question is, how loud should I mess around with my preamplifier in order to get the best gain structure within my recording? And since we're talking about gain, every time we talk about amplitude changes or gain, we refer to something called decibel. Now, the decibel is a logarithmic unit that represents a ratio between a physical quantity relative to a specified relative level. In other words, the decibel help us a lot to understand the audio phenomenon and understanding what happens. In other words, the decibel are used to measure amplitude of specific sounds relative to human hearings. Because that's exactly what we do when we hear something. We hear difference in amplitude based on ratios. In other words, how loud is an instrument versus another instrument? How loud is a sound compared to another sound? So the decibel, in other words, represents the amplitude of a sound relative to human perception. Now, the decibel was adopted in 1929 to honor his inventor, Alexander Graham Bell. One bell, one-tenth of the bell, decibel. And was primarily used to measure changes in signal power. So the decibel, as you can understand, is just a more convenient and easier way to express amplitude level changes rather than using different physics measurements. As a matter of fact, the decibel is used for engineering and science, in music, acoustic, electronics. So it's just a kind of like universal language that could simplify an understanding of level changes. For example, we have different version of the decibel for different scales. Let's say we're using the scale of voltage. Well, voltage has a dBU reading. For scale of power, we use dBm. For sound pressure level, we use SPL. As a matter of fact, for each one of these dB, we have different physical reference. So Pascal, generally, is the unit used to measure acoustic pressure. Volts, 
are generally used to measure electrical voltage, and of course, watts, audio power. So can you imagine having a guitar player in the studio just asking yourself, can you please raise my guitar off 3.2 Pascal? Refer to what? Whereas it's just easier to understand if somebody says, could you please raise my guitar solo about 3 dB or 3 decibel? Now, so as you can understand, the decibel right now provides a more consistent way, you know, in terms of understanding the different changes in these scales. And especially in audio, in a recording studio, different scales do work along with each other. So it's fundamental for you to understand the role that decibel have every time we are in the studio. So if we say something is 10 dB louder than something else, Let's take in this example, an electric guitar and an acoustic piano. If we say the electric guitar, it's 10 dB louder than a piano. Right now, the ratio, it's between these two values. So as you can understand right now, it's just easier for us to understand the relationship that there is between the differences in volume. Now, while working with decibel, you're gonna come across different dB that will represent different instances of the decibel. To name a few, dBFS, dBA, dBU, dBVU, dBV, dBVV, dBSPL, and so forth. So in order for us to kind of like wrap our head around what we really need in the studio, today we're going to talk about three specific type of dB. dBFS, which stands for dB full scale, dBU, and dBVU. So let me give you a little bit of a history of when the dB started to be useful and used in the recording studio. Back then when the only recording medium was tape, engineers need to figure it out a way to properly record audio with the best possible conditions. In other words, to find the sweet spot, also known as signal to noise ratio, in order to prevent audio to be recorded too loud, and in that case, distort the tape, and on the other side, they wanted to prevent to record audio too low. Because what would happen, especially with tape, if you would record audio too low, while bringing the good part of the signal up, you would bring up a lot of noise floor or tape hiss, which certainly wasn't something pleasant. Therefore, additionally to tape machines, they invented the VU meter. Now, the VU meter is a device that you're gonna find in a lot of console and a lot of analog devices today, and as well in plug-in version, because it does something very, very peculiar. In other words, the VU meter moves and represents a little bit more audio in terms of how our ears perceive loudness. But before going there, let me move back to the example we just did regarding tape machines. So with the addition of VU meter, the engineers back then figured out that the right sweet spot of program material being recorded to tape was at zero VU. Therefore, the zero VU was the best sweet spot, plus and minus, to record signal in order to avoid signal to distort and signal to be too low. Turns out that zero VU, which is still nowadays used in recording studio and professional facilities, it's equal to 1.23 volts which is exactly how we calibrate a lot of our professional equipment within a recording studio. So again, zero VU equals 1.23 V. And why this is so important? That's because the standard operating level of recording studio and professional equipment works at zero VU, which equals 1.23 V or volts. Now it turns out that 1.23 volts is also equal to plus 4 dBU, which is generally how we calibrate our converters and professional equipment in a recording studio. So it turned out that the zero VU is nonetheless equal to 1.23V, which is also equal to plus 4 dBU, which is nonetheless what we generally use to calibrate our equipment. But moving forward, when the digital era start kicked in, what is gonna happen when we have to convert our signal from purely analog to digital? What is our zero? How can we find the good 
level that engineers founded back then while recording in tape machine. So in the digital domain, we're facing a different type of DB, also known as DBFS. That stands for DB full scale. Now DB's full scale means that our meters inside Pro Tools or inside any DAW represent a scale up to the maximum zero, which is the zero below peaks. In other words, exceeding that zero is gonna cause our converters to clip and to distort sound. So recording too loud or recording too low, it's never a good idea as it can cause problems at a track level or mix bus level. For example, let's say you are recording drums. So you're setting up the room to record this majestic sound. So you want to be able to capture the bombasticness of the room, the sound of the drums, and while you are in the live room, everything sounds spectacular. Then you walk in the control room and you start hearing that the sound of the drums is completely crashed. The transient is being cut out and every LED in your system is clipping red. That screams for distortion, but not the nice pleasant distortion you would get with tape saturation. Very unwanted nasty digital distortion. That means that you are chopping up and literally cutting the initial part of the transient of a lot of your instrument, inducing into distortion, inducing into losing a lot of good part of your signal. But at the same time, another example could happen when you're maybe not clipping each single track inside your Pro Tools, but at some point, at some level while mixing, the summing is going to be clipped because the overall gain structure is going to be over exceeding the maximum threshold within your DAW. Of course, nowadays we're working with summing level that worked at 64 bit floating point, so there are ways to overcome recording a little bit too hot than usual. But this is not what we want to do. We want to make sure that the material we record matches and respect the correct gain structure in order to put in communication in a healthy communication, the analog system and the digital system. So again, the goal here is to find the right sweet spot to adopt analog domain and digital domain to find the right signal to noise ratio to be recorded with our system. So in the new era of making music again, Pro Tools plays a major role while it comes to record music. And while we're recording Pro Tools, we're going to be facing few challenges because right now we have talked about a VU meter and a zero VU, but then inside Pro Tools, we have a fader or a channel which represents two other zeros. So what's going on with the relationship between these three zeros? Before moving forward, I want to like to shed some light about the relationship between the three zeros you're going to be facing. So the zero VU, the zero on your fader, and the zero on the meter still inside Pro Tools. Now, we have already addressed the zero VU. So that is all clear. But what happened inside Pro Tools? Over here, as you can see, we have our fader or our channel, which represents two different scales. A scale of numbers that belongs to the fader, which indicates the gain in dB. And right to it, there is a meter, which has a scale that goes from the top zero to minus 16 down below, which meters indicates the levels in dB full scale. So again, it's really important for you to start getting a grasp of these two different types of readings within the meters. So again, what is the main difference between these two? Now, the fader scale shows unity gain at zero, which indicates that no changes from actual recorded level has been applied and has a reading between 12 dB boost and a full cut to minus infinity. Whether the meter scale to the right of the fader, it's a level scale based of the standard reference level digital audio system, which is zero dB full scale. And the zero at the top of the scale indicates the maximum peak digital level before clipping. So if you're wondering, should I match the zero dB VU with zero dB full scale? Absolutely not. The goal here is not to match the zero within your DAW with the zero on the VU meter on your console. Absolutely not. The truth of the matter here is that the analog level and the digital level, it's dictated by how you have calibrated your converters or A to D converters. Over here, we're using Avid HDIO converters and we generally calibrate them at plus four dBU. If you remember, plus four dBU equals 
1.23v, which equals 0vu, which in the digital domain inside your fader, this is equal to minus 18 dB full scale. Therefore, minus 18 is the actual right sweet spot to record your source. Now, why minus 18 dB or why 18 dB? Now, this has to do with a concept called headroom. And it needs to be clear for you that we have two different types of headrooms, whether we're talking about analog or digital. Now, calibrating a digital device or a digital system, it's way different from calibrating an analog system. As a matter of fact, unlike analog devices, which have the 0 dB VU, which corresponds to a specific numbers in volts, 1.23 volts, the 0 VU on an analog console or on an analog professional equipment can be passed. In other words, we have a little bit of headroom past the 0 VU which in some cases is generally used by some engineers while tracking to introduce a little bit of what is known to be harmonic distortion. Some very nice, pleasant harmonic distortion introduced by overdriving a little bit more the input of the preamplifier of the console. Whereas in digital, we do not have that. In digital, we're using converters, in this case, HDIO converters, calibrated to decibel below peaks. In other words, the zero that we see at the top of the meter represents our maximum point prior to reach distortion. So as you can understand, the headroom is a different concept whether we're talking about purely digital or purely analog. So generally, in order to have analog and digital device communicating one to another, 18 dB of headroom prior to the zero dB full scale is adopted. So this would mean that if we record a minus 18 dB, we're going to have approximately 18 dB of headroom, which could be used to insert plugins, send the signal to outboard gear, analog primarily, and maintain a very healthy level. Now, in order for us to have an 18 dB of headroom, that means that we have to have calibrated our converters to minus 18 dB FS. Minus 18 dB FS, it's calibrated at plus 4 dBU, which equal 1.23 V, which again, on the reading of a VU meter, shows up a zero VU. Quite of a trip right there, right? But I hope that that makes a lot of sense. So now we're having all these devices communicating one within another. Now, what is important also to keep in mind while recording is that the source that we record generally shows up two different types of levels, a peak level, and an RMS or average level, also known as root mean square. Now, what is important to keep in mind when we record music is that we're gonna be dealing with two different signals. That being the average part of the signal, also known as RMS, root mean square, and the peak level of the signal. Now, momentary transients, which are part of the peak part of the reading, can be up to 20 dB louder than our average signal. So it's really important for us to understand how to properly read the program material that feeds our converters or that feeds our Pro Tools. In other words, average or RMS levels describe the way we feel music in terms of loudness. Whereas the peak level, it's how loud music is, but for our recorders, for our converters. So as I told you before, peak level could be greater in volume compared to RMS, and sometimes are the problematic areas which are gonna cause our converters to clip. So we need to figure it out a way to handle the picks versus the average. And also we need to figure it out a way to understand how to read them. Now VU meter generally are really good to give us a reading of the overall average program material as they're very slow and they emulate a little bit more the way our hearing perceive music but they're not so great in reading peaks, as peaks happens over a very small amount of time. Whereas in the DAW, we have peak meters, which are gonna tell us only one version of the story, the peak level. So right now we have to figure out a way to blend these two readings in order to understand properly what is the peak versus the average level feeding our converters. Now, back then, Pro Tools only offered peak level metering reading, 
which was giving us only one portion of the story of the reading. So it was kind of like confusing to actually determine within the meter how to properly read the incoming signal. But right now, actually, inside Pro Tools, we could change the different readings upon our needs. So let me give you a demonstration. Over here, I have a song that was recorded and mixed properly at minus 18 dB. We are we're waiting to be reminded of how we've been brought far. Nothing's too far gone. So don't feel too shy if the signal seems too low. So as you can see here, the meter in Pro Tools is set to Pro Tools Classic. Now, the great thing about the Pro Tools meter is that it allows you to choose from different several industry standard meters upon what is the program material you need to mix. Another great feature is that you could actually set it up different meters between aux, audio, instrument tracks, and your master fader. Let's go ahead and analyze a little bit more the difference between these meters. Now over here, I'm going to change to the first meter, which is the sample peak meter. Now sample peak here provides the full Pro Tools metering. In other words, this is the only meter type that has a zero sample integration time and show all dynamics activity of the digital signal at every moment in time. Then we have the Pro Tools Classic, which is the one that all of us has used forever and ever and it provides the classic Pro Tools scale and metering ballistics. Moving along, we have the linear meter. This provides a direct one-to-one -one linear metering of sample peaks in audio signal with a metering range down to minus 40 dB. This meter generally offers great higher metering resolution closer to the zero dB, which is really useful, especially if you're dealing with mixing or mastering. Linear Extended pretty much use the same exact ballistic of the linear, but extend to minus 60 dB. Moving down below, we have the RMS meter. Now, this meter provides ballistic that display average loudness, root mean square, as we said before, over a range of time. Down below here, we have the VU meter, which is really close to the VU meter we have on our console. Now, the VU meter provides metering that emulates the response of a VU pin meter, which is the one, as I said, we have on the console, with the upper 50% of the meter covering a 6 dB range, from minus 3 dB to a plus 3 dB. The digital VU here provides the same VU ballistics, but with a little bit more of a modern scale. Down here, then, we start moving to the realm of broadcast metering. Now, in this case, PPM meters stands for peak program meters. And they're generally used for different types of broadcast application, the PPM Digital, the BBC, Nordic, EBU, and DIN. Now, I find myself that throughout all these years of working, I love using the K system. Now, the K system was created by the renowned mastering engineer, Bob Katz, and divides the K system in three different type of skills. K12, K14, and K20. Now the K scales are RMS based scales and include an integrated sample peak meter as a secondary value, which is great because right now we have two readings with one meter. We have our RMS reading and our peak meter reading, which makes this meter my favorite of all times. The K scale are designed to provide a more meaningful indication of the overall loudness, especially while mixing music applications. Now, using the K-System meters varies upon the program material that you're mixing. Now, first and foremost, the different K-Scale meters have different amount of headroom, from 12 to 20 dB of headroom. When using any K-Scale, the monitoring system must be calibrated such as the zero point of the scale corresponds to approximately 85 dB SPL. So switching between K-Scale meters requires recalibrating your monitor system. As a general rule of thumb, K20 is used to maximize the overall dynamic range of a reading and is used especially when mixing for large-scale theaters. Now, if mixing pop, rock, hip-hop, modern music with a very compressed sound and dynamic range, K14 
is the metering that generally gets adopted and is the metering that I love to use every time I mix. Lastly, we have K12, which is primarily used for metering program material that is designated for broadcast audio. So as you can understand right now through Pro Tools, we could customize the reading of our program material upon our needs, whether we're mixing or while we're recording. Now, in case you want to go a step further in understanding a little bit more the reading that feeds your system, there are third-party plugins that will, could help you out with that. One of my all-time favorite is made by a company called Isotope and it's called Insight2. Now, Insight 2 meters give us the ability to see both readings and customize them depending the overall dynamic range of our program material. If you're interested about understanding how Insight works, I've made a whole video series dissecting each single part of Insight, which I recommend you to check it. In the meantime, I'm going to show you the best two features while working with music that Insight 2 provides. The main two panels we're going to analyze right now are the level meters and the loudness meter. Now the level meter here works exactly as the meter we have described before. It displays both instantaneous true picks and average RMS level, and as well allow us to customize the scale based on pick, RMS, or any of the case system mentioned before. The other meter that I generally use is the loudness meter. Now, especially nowadays that music need to be loudness compliant upon if we're uploading the music on digital platforms such as Spotify, YouTube, Pandora, Amazon, or maybe you're working for broadcast, film, television, we need to make sure that the program material is loudness compliant. In other words, that we meet the target level in order for our program material to be put on air. You know, loudness war isn't anymore a thing. Maybe in the 80s, but we don't want any more to compress the life out of our program material. Therefore, having this sort of like standards allow us to mix and respect and record even more with respect the proper dynamic range of a signal. So in this case, the loudness meters offers different types of readings and let us set it up our audio and our metering readings based on different parameters, whether if we're working for film whether for working for music. So let's take a look at the loudness meter parameters. Over here we have three meters. The first meter is the short term meter. Now the short term meter averages the loudness over the course of three seconds. This is generally very useful when monitoring immediate trends of loudness. The second type of meter is our momentary meter. And this gives us a near almost instantaneous reading of the loudness and this averages the loudness over 400 milliseconds. Lastly, we have the integrated loudness, possibly the most important meter to read, especially if we're mixing to match a specific loudness compliant target. The integrated loudness meter here is gonna give us an integrated figure reading of the overall program. It's an infinite average that generates a single value for the entire duration of the calculation. And this is very important to read, especially not a lot while tracking, but a lot, especially while we're mixing. And this is really important because it's going to give us a kind of like broader overview of how loud our program material is. And based on this, now you know how to properly record your levels and how to read your levels, whether if you're just purely recording in a digital or in an analog domain, or maybe in a studio that blends both. Now here, to kind of like overcomplicate the situation a little more, I want to throw at you a couple of examples. Let's say we are having one system, our Pro Tools HD here in the studio, which is calibrated a minus 18. And at the same time, we have a home solution, a Focusrite 2i2 Scarlett. Now, home-based recording studios and non-professional equipment, it's calibrated at minus 16 dB full scale. So therefore, right now we're dealing with two different types of systems. We have a professional equipment, which is calibrated at minus 18 dB FS, and consumer equipment or home studio equipment, which is calibrated at minus 16 dB. So let's pretend right now we have an artist and we're recording that artist with our HD rig 
and with our Focusrite 2i2 rig. Same exact levels, same exact artist, same exact performance, the exact same thing. But one performance has been recorded at home, one performance has been recording in the studio. So what would happen if you would bring these two performances and swipe them and play them one in the studio and one in the home. So in other words, what would happen if I would open up the session that I've recorded with my HD rig with my home studio setup? And what would happen if I open my session that I've recorded with my home studio setup in a professional recording studio? Pretty easy. The session that we have recorded with our HD rig in the studio, if open it at home through a laptop or through your computer, is gonna sound 2 dB lower than it was while tracked in the studio. Whereas the session recorded at home at minus 16 dB, if you would open that into our recording studio, that would actually sound 2 dB louder. Because again, the two systems are calibrated to two different values. So it's really important for you to understand that while working between professional and non-professional equipment, there's gonna be some difference in levels. Also, why it's really important to work with proper calibration. In a recording studio, you're gonna end it up nine times out of 10 and patching in and using outboard gear, professional equipment, let's say an external compressor, an external EQ, and that equipment, it's being calibrated, once again, a plus four dBU. That means that if you record a signal at minus 18 dB, and then send that out while mixing or still tracking to an external outboard like a compressor at minus 18 dB. We said that minus 18 dB, it's equal plus four dBU, which is exactly the way we have calibrated our outboard gear, which in this case is gonna receive a very healthy signal. And now we know that we can manage properly that signal and have a healthy conversation in terms of loudness and in terms of sound between the material that we're recording and the outboard gear. So to conclude this lesson, why it's so important that you keep in mind the minus 18 dB full scale target level while tracking inside Pro Tools? Well, first and foremost, you're not gonna be clipping your converters. Second of all, you're gonna have a way more consistent RMS level across different project. Your converters will work around the same specs that they've been calibrated, plus, Analog gear will integrate smoothly every time you will have to send the signal out of your Pro Tools into Outboard and back into Pro Tools. And now I hope that you understand clearly the importance that there is between the relationship of analog, digital, and decibel. Until the next lesson, ciao.